So now we're going to open it up for a discussion. If the speakers from both the earlier session and this present one could just make themselves available towards the front. Um, I'll call on people to ask, that want to ask questions and, um, and maybe the speakers can answer using the floor microphone here. Any questions? Elizabeth. effects. So in essence, what that's saying is what we did was good enough. And so I think it's going to depend very much on the exact question you want. If you want a relationship to, you know, a particular part of the Parasylvian fissure, using a, an atlas-based technique is not going to be very good. Um, on the other hand, if you want, like, levels of effect at some grosser scale then the techniques that we have will work. So it really is going to be question dependent how much the variability affects what's going on. And I think that's always been true and will continue to be true forever. Tomas? So uh, two questions. One for Steve. So keep the mic, and the other one for the resting state folks. Uh, so the one for you, uh, I, I love the lesion-based test, but uh, I think you would convince me a bit more if you set up the test within the frontal lobes with one region that is your articulation, high articulation, but there were many places in the frontal lobe that showed low articulation. Now, if the two differ, then I think you are up to something, but comparing frontal lobes with a big, very different chunk of the brain is not as convincing. Absolutely. So we think of this as preliminary data, which maybe should help us give a grant. Now, <laughs> which thus far hasn't worked very well. So let me tell you, those regions were chosen not totally at random. And I totally agree that to me the next place to pick is like something right in the middle of our frontal parietal network, which is a big area with low participation coefficients. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's to me a ton of controls to be before you're completely convinced or even sort of convinced about this. But we chose those regions because as we've heard multiple times today, these are hubs. These are the hubs, these are, these are the hubs, these are the hubs. To our way of thinking, which admittedly is a very different set of criteria 
that you put hubness through, they aren't hubs. They are very provincial things. They're, they're local hubs that are provincial hubs that are hubs of the default network, but they're not hubs to us in the intuitive sense that if you take them away, you break big chunks of the network. And that, so we chose them specifically for that because every, you know, I'll stop there. Can I have the second one? Sure. So, uh, well, Mike, I don't see Michael, but any of you can perhaps answer it, but he, he made a fairly strong statement that uh, resting state shows moderate to high reliability. My reading of the literature is somewhat different. I'm a bit less optimistic, and so I'm just wondering what, what that statement is based on, and, and hopefully it's not based on the pattern of connectivity, and that you, you have some test, retest data that uh, support that. Yes, there are three different studies published from our group using uh, one intrins intrinsic functional connectivity approach, the other ICA, and the other FLFF, using the so-called, it's a classic right now, NYU test retest data set, where a group of uh, typical adults have been scanned uh, uh, within sessions and between sessions with uh, approximately eight months apart was the long-term test retest reliability. We measure test retest reliability with ICC, uh, and uh, yes, the maps, uh, even a voxel wise, are moderate to high test retest. Also, we learned that uh, the test retest uh, reliability varies as a function of a uh, region and uh, measure. Right, so. There's can another can study I, I in, uh, actually, from you, uh, in children. Uh, another study in uh, elderly population, and another one on graph theory. The graph theory one is a little more complicated. Can, can I just clarify? Uh, that's what I expected that you would say, that, uh, that, that the ICA will give you more or less the same result. That's not good enough for me, because if I present a visual stimulus, I do get activity in the visual cortex. Uh, whether I do it a week later or a month later, it's still the same result. What I want is to see whether I have high test retest reliability in the magnitude of that response so that I can use yeah. that matrix as a quantitative phenotype that is stable rather than showing yeah. the saying that, yeah. oh yes, every time I put someone in the scanner, I see the visual cortex responding no. to visual stimuli. No. But the ICA is kind of more on the side of the example with the visual cortex, I'm afraid. Yeah, and the when we did uh, intrinsic functional connectivity, so at this point we are measuring the strengths of the connections through correlations, or, then the ICC increases as a function of the strength. So the stronger correlation, the higher is the ICC. But, so but weak, how strong is the test retest of the strength? Uh, it goes, uh, we really could, I could, after this, I could look at the slides that has those maps so we can look at the papers. Um, and we're talking about 0.5 and up ICC moderate to high, and it, it, it varies regionally. It decreases, like subcortical regions are less uh, reliable than uh, cortical. And, and there's also one other thing I want to say. In a study where we look at relationship between connectivity and autistic traits, it's published as well in 11 uh, in AJP, uh, we, looked, uh, we used that uh, sample as convenient sample to look at the test retest reliability of that of a brain behavior relationship, and it was al also was 0.5 and up for a specific circuit uh, uh, that emerged from the analysis. Bear. Uh, really great talks, thank you so much. Very provocative from every one of you guys, so thank you. Um, so, you know, bringing back that this whole idea of trying to capture dynamic change, and I hear different aspects of networks, of nodes, hubs, vulnerable regions, and so forth, you know, being characterized depending on the type of analysis that we're using. I want to see from, you know, if anyone can answer, Steve also as well, are you looking for or finding regions that you think are foundational? So for example, that's what we have claimed in our, our, our latest article, that hubs are foundational, they don't change with development. And distinguish from aspects of networks that you are starting to see are amenable 
to plasticity or to changing through development because I think we want to end up being able to identify and I th maybe looking at overlaps with like fetal all the way to ADHD type of differences. Are there networks that you can see? These are the ones that are ones that are exerting the ability to, you know, have the environment affect connectivity. <laughs> okay, I, I don't want everyone to run at the same time. All right, well, um, I think, um, you know, how to approach that, that question is, right now, from my perspective, it's, it's kind of a I don't know. I don't know if the data, there's the data type to answer those types of questions where you can look at how, you know, how these external environmental um, um, events can affect kind of the longitudinal trajectory of a given system or a given measurement or a given metric. I don't know if the data is out there yet to really be able to determine that particular question per se. <laughs> this, the more things change, the more things stay the same. <laughs> <laughs> what, what you're saying brings up an import, what I think is a but um, but I think that that's the I think that's part of the goal. Like a lot of a lot of our work and a lot of others here, that's kind of the that's part of the goal. That's kind of the kind of the you know the end the end the end goal is trying to determine what systems, what measurements, what what aspects, what characteristics of the system are good predictors of kind of long term outcomes and. You know what systems are, what system, what aspects, what parameters are most amenable to change. So yeah. I mean, I think this opens a huge can of worms, and and maybe the answer, the thing I want to say is there's two two things. One is the dynamics. There are dynamics at multiple scales here, and so answering the kind of question that you're trying to ask is is it's a absolutely typical complex systems question for people who look at ecosystems and stuff is there are things that are affected on an hourly basis, a daily basis, a monthly basis, a yearly basis, a hundred years, but you know, you have your hundred year flood. Well, that's because of the dynamics of complex systems. You know you're gonna have one, you just don't know when. So let me say two pragmatic things. One is, in our hands, and if you're going to do complex analyses, the idea that six minutes or seven minutes or eight minutes of resting state give you a reasonable picture is just not true. There are now multiple papers and data that we have, which unfortunately is not published yet, that there are very clear dynamics in networks on the order of a half an hour. So number two, we have Russ Poldrack's he wants it to be called the Russome. <laughs> We've been calling it the Poldrome, <laughs> but he wants us to change, so I'm gonna try and say, so the Russome, <laughs> it's very computationally hard, it's turned out to us, and we have to implement it on a supercomputer to do this well, but I can tell you very clearly that in Russ's data, there is low reliability, so you take a whole bunch of data and you have a whole bunch of other data, and the question is, how much of the other data do you have to get where it asymptotes? Where your correlation or your ICC or whatever reliability you want to measure, how much do you have to get before it asymptotes? And I can tell you, we've been able to do this for 15 minutes. So like 100 grabs of, of a whole bunch of 15 minutes worth of data. And it's very clearly not asymptoted at 15 minutes. So everybody that's collecting, you know, you're collecting six minutes of data and you think you're going to characterize individual, you know, community structure, it's just not enough. It is not enough. Debbie Downer. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just comment on that? Um, and, and, and I mean, it also, go, also goes in the other direction. So, I mean, you, you get fairly static maps at five or ten minutes, but if you use much shorter windows, you can actually see that there's a lot of dynamic going on, too. That's what I mean about Yeah, dynamic. okay, so, so it goes, um, so it goes yeah. both directions, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, we've done this also with our monkey data, so, I mean, 
if you use, let's say, just 30 seconds or a minute, the networks look totally different. And there's a lot of dynamic and hyper-synchronization that you see between, between areas and between networks. And so, I mean, there's a lot more in it than just a typical five or 10 minutes. Uh, absolute, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So again, what's amazing is that this works at all because <laughs> it's a very noisy system at multiple levels. And yet, there are some striking principles that are emerging. And it is a huge challenge. We're, we're imaging for too short a period of time, but try and get kids to be in the magnet, to, you know, super still, unless we headbolt them, which is going to be a little problem, uh, et cetera. We, I mean, we have all of these, these challenges that are facing us, and yet there are principles that are emerging. And, uh, you know, Bea yesterday highlighted BJ's paper as sort of the start of this field. And that notion that there are, again, functional principles that manifest Huttenlocker's observation, that there are uh, differences in the way in which neurons communicate with each other depending on developmental stage, that is emerging in this fragmentary mosaic-like way. I mean, we, do, we don't get nice high-resolution pictures, but we're getting fragments of this so that subcortical relationships look like they're stronger in kids and they tend to weaken over the maturational process. And the cortical cortical are more prominent later on. And so, you know, again, those are uh, all tentative, but they, they do seem to converge on, on uh, providing us with a sense of what some of the underlying principles are. And that's really what we're trying to, right. to scope out. But the counterpoint to this is your and Mike's avowed goal is you want to be biomarker something that you can do a test on an individual about. What I'm saying is you're shooting yourself in the foot if the amount of data that you collect is clearly insufficient to get re So yeah, you can throw 100 individuals at something and you can learn a lot. Of, hell, we've you know, made a career of this. But when you want to get to the individual level, you're going to need more data per individual. A lot more data per individual. So, so, this so, uh, this is uh, going to, uh, so we're now into the next part of our time. So right. I'm going to say, <laughs> as always, the discussion is much more interesting than we anticipate. We wish we had more time. But I'm going to set prerogative of this moderator. One more question, one more answer, and then we'll close the session. This really should be a question for Mike, but I figured I would ask it anyway. He talked about um, undersampled studies for doing classification, um, and he kept saying bigger samples, bigger samples, but just wondering, like, how do we find that number, and are there, you know, I don't know of any power analyses that are out there that can tell us what an adequate sample size is. So just saying bigger and bigger, isn't super helpful on a practical level. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. We're all making this up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that convinced us was a simulation that we did as part of the, the PNAS, the Biswell 2010 paper. It's in the supplementary data. And so if you have a thousand individuals, uh, and the correlation between PCC and uh, age, I think, was, was the relationship, uh, connectivity, et cetera. Um, what happens if you have fewer than that? And so there were a series of simulations with random samples from 10 to 1,000. And the, uh, the mean value is pretty stable, but the confidence intervals are gigantic until you get to sample sizes of 150 or so. And uh, beyond that, they really taper very gradually. So that's one partial explanation, that uh, when we publish with 15, 20, or 30, we're having a point estimate, but it's got a gigantic confidence interval. And so we, we can't really be confident that it's going to differentiate from other estimates. And we need to get into, into the three figures or so to, to get those narrower. If you get to 2,000, uh, then you know, everything is significant and you get a different set of problems. Um, so 
there are balancing acts in there. Then if you put in overlays of, of genetic markers or things like that, all of a sudden your cell size has dropped to, to almost nothing because you've got such sparse matrices there, and so then you get, again, into the sample size problem. So it's, it's all bootstrapping, but uh, to be confident, confidence intervals, uh, it, it takes larger samples than we usually work with. Okay, so thank you everybody, great talks. So just a couple housekeeping things. Lunch will be served in Le Bateau. I don't know where that is exactly. I got in after midnight last night. It's over there, okay. Um, it'd be great if all of the poster presenters would just queue up first, jump ahead so that you can get your food because the poster presentations are gonna go on during the lunch session, which is in Kings Garden East. All the poster details are in your program. Please ensure that you're back here at 1.40 p.m. and then Marichal wants to make a comment or two. Just a couple of quick uh, last minute notes as well. Um, we've had a number of people inquire about how they can order the uh, art prints from the students that are on display there. We now have a sign up sheet at the registration table. So if you're interested in buying any of those prints, just come and see us at the uh, desk.